Hello everyone, bringing you a video today to mark the 40th anniversary of the end of the Falklands War and for this particular video I wanted to bring you a contrast between British and Argentine kit. And what we're looking at here is a recreation of a Royal Marine, or the kit of a Royal Marine on the mannequin here, and a recreation of an Argentine infantryman of the Argentine Army, uh, fairly typical. There are variations from unit to unit of course, uh, obviously in British uh, forces the, there's a major difference between the Royal Marines, the Parachute Regiment and men, men of 5th Infantry Brigade and units within those uh, varied considerably as well and the same is true of Argentine forces, Argentine Army compared to Argentine Marines and even specific units within the Army and the Marines varied in terms of the kit that was issued. So this is somewhat generalised, I'm going to be talking in general terms comparing the web equipment and so forth but obviously these are set up to represent two specific uh, specific um, sets of equipment. It does vary from individual to individual and unit to unit, of course, so uh, this isn't the be all and end all. Obviously the marine, or the mannequin representing a marine is set up here with the Arctic rucksack on the back, which we'll get to in a little bit. So on the march or yomping, as the marines referred to it, as the march across the islands. Uh, whereas we've got a lot less kit on the Argentine mannequin because obviously this is representing a German in a static defensive position. Uh, obviously a slight difference there just from the point of view of the, the specific role these two individuals would have been carrying out. So uh, or the specific uh, part of the conflict that's being represented in each mannequin here. So we'll start by comparing headgear and in the case of the uh, Royal Marine mannequin here we have the Commando Green Beret with the subdued cap badge here, the globe surrounded by laurel with the crown above and this is fairly typical for Royal Marines. British forces in the Falklands did wear helmets in some instances, but the Royal Marines tended to stick with the beret. And indeed, in certain instances, berets were actually ordered for other British forces, notably the Scots Guards at Tumbledown were ordered to wear their berets to try and uh, reduce the risk of misidentification between Argentine and British forces. In contrast, of course, we have the M1 helmet here on the Argentine mannequin. This is worn with a hood from the combat smock as a cover over the top set of goggles at the front here, and it's actually worn over the cold weather cap. The M1 helmet was basically standard for Argentine forces in the Falklands, and the vast majority of men wore their helmets at most times, and that's what we have on the mannequin here. Uh, basically, uh, an M1 helmet per the American design. The uniform differs considerably. Most Argentine forces wore a, a plain green uniform, or, or all a drab uniform. Some units did wear camouflage, but these tended to be specialist or, or more special forces units commando units. So the standard issue of camouflage to British forces, obviously not only the Royal Marines were wearing DPM, everyone deployed to the Falklands basically was wearing DPM. Some of the outer garments were plain green, the waterproofs and the, and the, uh, the outer garments, uh, uh, the protective clothing was, was plain green, but the combat clothing was all camouflage for British forces. What we have on the uh, mannequin here representing a Royal Marine is the Arctic windproof smock, which we've looked at in detail in a previous video relatively recently and this is of course made of gabardine it's windproof it's an outer garment underneath this you'd have insulating layers such as the combat liner potentially jersey heavy wool maybe a kf shirt or the uh, norgy shirt potentially that would vary somewhat from individual to individual as to what was available it's also potentially there to private purchase items as well but this is the outer garment worn over other insulating layers the similar situation with the Argentine uniform here. Other layers would be worn under this, obviously, the combat uniform. They also had a very similar jersey heavy wool that was worn underneath as well. But this is the sort of iconic outer garment, which is the Dubon Parker or a development of the Dubon Parker, Dubon Parker. This particular example is Israeli. I've mentioned this in previous videos talking about this. It's not absolutely 100% accurate. It's missing one arm pocket, which we'll get to as we move this round. But otherwise, it's very representative of the outer garments that were worn in the Falklands by Argentine forces. It's of Israeli design. The majority of them being worn in the Falklands were of uh, Argentine manufacture. So that's what we have here. Uh, slight contrast in the way of doing things there. This is a heavy padded outer garment, whereas this is a thin windproof outer garment to be worn over insulating layers. So that's the con contrast with the, the basic uniform there that we have. The equipment is very, very different. And obviously, uh, just to stress again, this is not uh, representative of every unit in the Falklands uh, in terms of Argentine forces. 1958 pattern web equipment was fairly standard, was basically the standard across the vast majority of British troops in the Falklands. So we have 
a nice 58 pattern web equipment here in a slightly stripped down configuration because of the, the rucksack and we'll get to that shortly. But at the front here you can see the yoke supporting the two ammunition pouches there, the belt running round, fairly standard setup of 958 pattern equipment at the front here, bayonet carried on the side of the pouch as we'll see as we move this round, so fairly standard set of equipment there made of cotton webbing, not fantastic because it does absorb water of course and that increases the weight, uh, but uh, slightly, uh, certainly somewhat better than the leather equipment used by the Argentines. The leather equipment was not um, issued to everybody, it was the older set of equipment. Uh, some troops had received the new Tempex equipment which was made of nylon, which in some ways was an advance on the British equipment that was being issued at the time. But this is the, the iconic sort of green dyed leather equipment that was issued to quite large numbers of Argentine forces at this time. I believe this had been introduced in the 1960s and in the early 1980s it was in the process of being replaced with, with the Tempex nylon equipment, which was based heavily on US practice. This in some ways is also based off US practice, it's almost a leather version of the US M1956 equipment. As we'll see it has H-shaped suspenders, so similar to the yoke of the British equipment. You have two leather ammunition pouches at the front there, occasionally you see more carried as well. Each of these carries only two magazines for the FAL, which is obviously very similar to the SLR used by the British, so the, the main small arm used the, the basic infantry rifle, the two sides was basically identical in function, fired the same ammunition. The Argentines fired for automatic, of course, which is slightly different, but obviously for practical purposes, it's a lot more sensible to fire on semi-automatic. You only have two magazines in each of these, whereas these have a, a greater carrying capacity. You can fit three magazines in each of these, and you can, of course, carry the larger magazines for the LMG as well. The 30 round magazines for the LMG will fit in these, whereas these will only take 20 round magazines for the, uh, the rifle, which was the standard arm, the Argentine forces. So a contrast in the, the sort of uh, capacity of the ammunition carriage there on the two equipments as well. Obviously this is a modern design of web belt here on the Royal Marine setup, and you just have a simple uh, tongue buckle there on the leather belt of the Argentine equipment. So that's a contrast of the front of the web equipment. We've talked about the uniform and the headgear. We'll start moving these mannequins around and have a look at some of the other details that we can see of the equipment and the uniform. So looking at the right-hand side of the two mannequins here, there's quite a bit more to talk about on the British mannequin, on the, the Royal Marine setup here. We have the side profile of the Arctic rucksack at the back there. You can see underneath the main flap we have the uh, sleeping mat here, kit mat, which is made of a, a foam, um, plastic foam, obviously to give an insulating layer between the body and the ground. We can see the side pocket here. This has press studs on it to allow it to be folded away when it's not in use. That's carrying the small kit in there. And then down at the bottom here, you can see the end of the survival bag, which contains the Arctic sleeping bag, which has been bungeed onto the pack frame there. You can see the frame coming down here. This is an external metal frame, aluminium frame, painted in this gold tone, which is the, the, the style of frame that was in use at the time of the Falklands. Those you see manufactured afterwards are in a, a dark olive drab colour, but this is a Falklands era frame. And then on the basic web equipment here, we have obviously the, the side profile of the ammunition pouch at the front here. If we lift the arm out of the way, you can see the water bottle pouch here, which in standard 958 pattern practice carries a water bottle, a plastic water bottle, and a plastic cup in there. We can contrast this with the Argentine mannequin here. We have the Argentine water bottle round on the belt here. If we just move the arm forward a little bit, you can see this here. It's in a simple canvas, very lightweight canvas cover. Uh, this has been heavily repaired at the back. These were not particularly durable, so they're often seen uh, modified and with additional belt loops added on the back or a new belt loop sewn on because they didn't hold together very well. The press studs that hold the bottle in place often pop out as well. So not a, a great design, but it does the job. And that's carrying an aluminium water bottle. Now this is essentially based on German practice or the original design of this was based on German practice. And these have been in use for many, many years. They were modified and updated in having a plastic cap fitted, which we have here. And this is a screw cap. The neck of the bottle was modified with a plastic insert, which you can see here, so that a screw cap could be used. So in both cases, we have the water bottle carried around on the side of the belt there. Uh, quite a difference in the way that was done. There's no cup included with this. In some instances, uh, Argentine troops, again, there were quite a few different designs of bottle or canteen in use, with, uh, in use by Argentine troops at this time, uh, one of which was very similar to the US system of the plastic water bottle and metal cup nesting together. 
in a very similar style of cover. Uh, you see the Marines have their own version as well, so there are various different ways of doing it. This is basically standard uh, for the Brits. You do also see the older 1944 pattern cup and bottle in use in some instances as well, but this is basically the standard water bottle. There's a lot more variation to be seen in terms of Argentine kit there. Again, a transitional period for the Argentinian uh, army and Marines as well. So there we are, that's a look at the right hand side of the mannequin. Uh, the two mannequins, we'll move these around now and have a look at the back. So I'm just having to give the mannequin here a little bit of support. So looking at the back of the mannequin, we can see, looking at the back of the, the Royal Marine setup here, we can again see the kit mat, the sleeping mat carried across the top of the Arctic rucksack there. The main flap coming down here, there is a zip compartment in the top here, unfortunately the zip is broken. It's for the time it was introduced in the 1970s, it's quite a good design. Obviously a lot of kit being carried here, spare clothing, rations, small kit, your, uh, your shelter, so you'd have your poncho and various items for, for rigging that up, bungees, paracord, pegs and so forth if need be. And then at the bottom here, you've got the survival bag, as we said before, with the sleeping bag, the Arctic sleeping bag inside it. And this has been bungeed onto the frame, as you can see there, to secure it beneath the main body of the rucksack itself. So quite a hefty load being carried on the back here. By contrast, we don't have any load carried on the back here. The Argentine equipment, in general, the Argentine forces didn't have an equivalent to this. You see the men coming ashore with what they call a ranch bag, which is similar to the, the rear pack used by the Americans on their equipment set, just carried over the shoulder on a shoulder strap, and then kit bags. And in the field, the kit carried was very light indeed, particularly for those men who were operating in uh, defensive positions. This is basic infantry we're talking about here, not special forces or anything of that nature. So that's the back of the two mannequins, a big contrast obviously in the amount of kit that's being carried and this does give you uh, the idea of, you know, in full marching order that is to say, or with full kit being carried, the weight and the bulk of the kit that was required. Obviously this wouldn't be carried all the time and there were efforts made to reduce the load carried by British troops. Um, the Royal Marines as uh, to the greatest degree possible. You do see Obviously, when men can deposit the Bergen or the rucksack, they'd just be carrying potentially just the, the sleeping bag and the sleeping mat, for example. That does turn up in photographs as well. It would depend on the specific scenario as to what would need to be carried by the individual. Now, looking at the left-hand side of the two mannequins, you can see round here on the side of the ammunition pouch, the British setup, we have the bayonet for the self-loading rifle. You see the side profile of the rucksack again there with the various bits of kit carried, the sleeping mat, sleeping bag and survival bag at the bottom there. And then if we look at the, the mannequin here, the Argentine kit, you can see the bayonet for the FAL. Now this would indicate an, uh, one of the folding stock examples of the FAL. This particular design of bayonet is designed to fit over the muzzle device used by the uh, FAL rifles, used by the Argentine forces which had that folding stock. Again, just having to provide a little bit of support to the mannequin here because the weight of the, uh, the rucksack is quite a lot for one of these torso mannequins. So uh, there it is, that's a look at the, the left hand side of these two. So there we are, I do hope you found it interesting looking at these. I found it very interesting putting them together and making the video. I've, I've enjoyed making this, it's something I've wanted to do for quite a while. I had been holding out for an improvement to this setup obviously with a proper Argentine issue Parker. That's something I'm still going to look for obviously not just that uh, search is not going to come to an end just because the, the 40th anniversary has, has passed by now. Uh, it's uh, something I'd still like to, to improve upon is this set of Argentine equipment for future displays. It's something I'd like to display at events where it's uh, uh, an appropriate theme for the specific event. So, as I say, I do hope you found it interesting looking at these two. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you've hit the little bell, the notification button down below that will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.